Hey guys, Mike here with Cine Samples and Hollywood Scoring. And welcome back. This is uh, another episode of our Composers Workshop. And uh, in this first series, we're interviewing some of our friends from the music scoring community here in Los Angeles. And uh, in this episode, we're going to be uh, interviewing uh, Phil O'Connor, who plays uh, the clarinet, uh, and all the clarinets, and all the saxophones. So, Phil, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm a musician uh, here in Los Angeles. I've been here since 1996. Uh, I moved here from New York. was there for a couple of years and grew up in Northern California. And uh, just really, you know, humbled to be part of the community here. So. Cool. How many years have you been uh, playing clarinet and, and orchestras here? Uh, here in town? Yeah. Uh, right when I moved here, quite fortunately. So uh, 17 years. Cool. All right, let's get right into some, uh, some clarinet. Great nerd talk. <laughs> so um, I guess the first question we should ask is, uh, what are some of the most difficult things to play on the clarinet? Some of the things that composers sometimes write for you, and you roll your eyes and um, and go, "Oh, this guy's a newbie." <laughs> well, I, I try never to roll my eyes because it's you know, like I said, it's a humbling experience to be part of the community. Right, here. Yeah. But the, I guess if you go right off the bat, there are certain things that happen when. When someone might ask for a slide, uh, you know, that's a, a half step, and they, they want to have, you know, the, uh, it moves from a, a somewhat rigid note in one register to the next. Uh, even a half step can be a, a treacherous spot to, to be in. All right. Can you demonstrate something? <laughs> sure. So, for example, if, if someone has a slide uh, that's a half step from concert A flat to concert A, uh, you'll see that all of my fingers go down. Um, so that's not a particularly great land to live in. As, as much as you can slide. So there's, unless you open a, a side key, okay. which is, and you can see that the, when you get to the, the A, it's, it's kind of a, a flabby sound. It's not the, the actual uh, resonance that you would be looking for. I see, okay. So are there some trills and, and things that you can't do? Is there uh, some uh, that make it difficult as well. So in that same uh, register as you would move, say, from um, A flat again in, into, uh, if you have a half step, that becomes easier to facilitate, but the top note is, is still a little funny. Or if you have a whole step, uh, for example, so as you go from the A flat to uh, a B flat, mm. you have to hit both of the side keys here. Other than doing this, I see. You can see where it oh, can, so there's alternate fingering. To yeah, to a certain extent. Uh, you know, again, when when you're dealing with the registral, uh, you know, people call it a break or an interruption. Uh, really is just because uh, as you're moving, when the register key goes down, it uh, it moves a twelfth instead of an octave, like some of the you know, like saxophones have, for example. There's complexities there as well. But when you're moving, um, e even just you know, a minor second or uh, a major second can be a, a real problem in, in some registers. When you get into the higher register, for example, if you were to use a regular fingering for a concert B flat to a concert C, it is not so easy to facilitate. You see that I'm, I have a lot of movement going on here. Uh, there's a trill fingering for that is not particularly pleasant sounding. Gotcha. All right, so now when composers are writing for the clarinet, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays we're sitting in front of our computers and we're, we're working with samples. Right. And we're having to fake the sound of the clarinet. And a lot of that has to do with knowing what the clarinet can do. Right. And performing things that are idiomatic for the clarinet. Mm -hmm. and, um, and sometimes we hear some composers who are just getting started write things that are just not possible. Have you ever seen anything um, come across that uh, looks less idiomatic that perhaps, because you know, we, we write, we write with the keyboard, We're, you know, and play stuff yeah. in. It works with the keyboard, but it might not work. On yeah, the I would say that something that is, is uh, keyboard friendly, uh, like for someone that's, that's adept like yourself or, or uh, Mike Berry is at, at the keyboard, certainly, um, if you write things in octaves, for example, and just use you as an example because, you know, two friends of mine. If you're playing things in octave, octaves on the keyboard and it translates to the clarinet, it, comes, it becomes actually quite ungainly, is where most people would think, oh, that, it's not so bad to just play octaves. But just to give you an example, uh, I'll move from an octave G to another G in, uh, in the low registers like this. So just by making that movement, it's not particularly pleasant. The same thing would be is if you move from, say, a C to a C in the upper register. 
So uh, immediately you can see that there's a lot of movement going on and you're not just staying on one, uh, one fingering and then hitting the register key. It, it doesn't work like that at all, unfortunately. So that movement uh, can create a lot of uh, unwanted emphasis, I would say, like what we would call in wind music an agogic accent or an overemphasis on the, the upper note. Got it. So it's interesting. So it's, it's, it's difficult to do that on the clarinet. And that's why if you were to do that with a sample, it sounds unrealistic because... Right. You're not doing something. That yeah, you can it's something properly. that I imagine, like you know, if uh, and you guys do a great job of sampling, obviously. But when you know you have something like that, even with you know any of the most seasons of uh, seasoned of professionals, it's not something that yeah, um, you know, is ever going to sound idiomatic just because of the nature of the instrument. Can you just perform like a a, a phrase or, or sure? A, let's let's talk maybe a little bit about legato and yeah, um, just perform like a legato phrase and and. So now I, what I can hear there is at the end of your phrase, you automatically put sort of little hairpins or, or diminuendos. Yeah. So and what uh, happens there in, in that phrase, uh, the very opening of that movement, you're playing along with the soon horn and uh, you're trying to find yeah. a third relationship, you know, like you're trying to create another instrument. So the way that I, I believe it's been a while since I played that, but again, when you're just put on the spot, play something that comes to mind. I mean, that's the essence of legato and the clarinet in a lot of ways. And, you know, like just sitting here and, and having the concert G be a little bit low, you know, the, so that's the process that we go through as performers, obviously, but um, the, the thing that's kind of, anything that you have internalized, there's, there's it's always a work in progress, and the thing that's kind of fun to adapt for the recording community is uh, that process is, is truncated quite a bit, so mm -hmm. like the moment that we look at something, you're trying to process the information and go, well, how do we do this best? So if, if you were doing the same sort of thing, um, leaping around, say, you know, like if, if someone liked that that uh, that phrase, but then the, the very first interval would be from the, the C to a D, but you, you instead you went a ninth instead of a second, it would be treacherous. Mm -hmm. It would be not t terribly idiomatic or right. hard to, to, you know, keep that, that uh, range of, uh, of phrase shape. I okay. Say. Now, you mentioned about playing with an ensemble. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking before about dynamics. Right. Um, when you see, you know, say a forte on your part, mm -hmm. I mean, is a forte a forte all the time? No. No, well, I mean, not, not. I mean, for me, no. I mean, it really, depending on what kind of relationship I have with the composer and understanding their music, um, and this is, I think, would be important for the composer community as well, is that when they write forte, we're still thinking of adjectives that they're going to go along with what's there in the music. So. Um, a forte in Mahler four, you know, there's there's going to be 150 different versions of forte in, in that. Whereas you have forte in uh, in the beginning, uh, well, maybe three minutes into Afternoon of Fun by Debussy, it's, it's going to have a different range and different meaning and different color. And you know, there's timbre is always married to dynamics with with someone that's really trying to think artistically for for your other people's music. Right. So in an ensemble in a woodwind section, who's sort of the section leader well, generally? In in orchestral setting, um, it, it's a very interesting and unique question because I think if you asked each of us individually, you're going to get a different answer. I, I look at it as that uh, you know you listen up, you know. So really, it's it's kind of basing things that way. Like you know, so for example, if the flute's sitting in front of me, then I'm listening up that way. Generally, you know, I'm not playing above them in, in a range other than in very specific instances, like in you know uh, Stravinsky music or something like that, where you have large terrace dynamics and the ranges are, are quite removed from each other. One of the first things we learn about the clarinet as orchestration students is the is the break or, or the bridge mm -hmm. uh, on the clarinet between this, the G and the A. Mm -hmm. uh, can you demonstrate that for us and what why that's a problem? Sure. And what you'll see uh, if if there's a, a tight camera shot, you'll you'll see my fingers. There'll be a lot of finger movement, even though it's just a major second. You'll, you'll yeah. see that it. Okay, so what I hear is a break in the sound a little bit. Right. You have to re-tongue the second note? Or? No, it just seems that way because like without having other fingers down, uh, what you learn is you, you try to add a little bit more uh, heftiness to the sound on the G to compensate for, you know, when, when you're playing the A, it, all your fingers are down and you get a lot more resonance from the bell. Okay, so by default, if we were writing a slur from G to A, mm -hmm. maybe uh, sort of a high school or elementary school student would, you would hear a break. You'd hear it. Okay. You 
okay. hear, you know, I, you, it's kind of fighting what your training is, but you know, like you'd hear much more of a percussive bump when you're, you're moving to the upper note. All right, but when you do it, generally you, you try to smooth it out. It's one of those things that, you know, again, you, you work your whole life on, on something like that, you know, it's okay. just to, to try to smooth things over, you know, unless someone's looking for that. And so as a, you know, an, someone who's an orchestrator in Hollywood, and they're working with you guys, mm -hmm. do they need to even worry about that kind of a you know, limitation to the instrument? Again, just depending on, on whatever, there's a, a velocity issue that can happen. So if it becomes faster and faster, like if we're playing a 30 second note passage, it's something that becomes qu quite readily impossible, or okay. at the minimum very difficult. So uh, with that many fingers moving, there's uh, a, a decrease in accuracy, certainly. I see, okay. So if you're doing like G A B C yeah. E A, like just do it kind of like the four notes. Yeah. Let me hear you do it. <laughs> or uh, G A B C, you said. G A B C. Right? But like go up and down. It, it, it's a little it, awkward. It, it, can be, it can get awkward very quickly. Okay, you know, that's it, good. To I know. mean, if, if you had a switch around. You can see that you know immediately. Like I'm, I, as I was creating a different pattern, I, I yeah. in my head went from you know using the left hand down to the right hand. So these are the things that we're going to map out when we see someone's music for the, the first time. Well, hopefully we might see it a little bit sooner than that. Sometimes. But okay. That, that's where our problems lie. Yeah. Cool. Um, great. Well, that's a B flat clarinet, and mm -hmm. I want to kind of get to the other clarinets. Sure. Um, so the other, what's the most popular clarinet? Obviously, this is the first one you pick up when you yeah, just see like a clarinet. Yeah, um, when, when someone generally will write for the clarinet, uh, the, the one that I think most people would think that they're inferring would be a, a B-flat clarinet. All right, and it's transposed. Yeah. When you write a note, you hear, you hear it down a, a major step. second. Yeah, right. so like so if D. someone was looking at a score, an untransposed score, then they're going to, uh, you know, what, what, you know, when someone explains uh, from the podium, let's say that they were working with us in a recording situation, and they say, you know, okay, uh, you know, clarinet add a part, add a, a C and a D, um, and you know, I'll, I'll might have to ask them, well, do you, you mean B flat or is it okay, cool. pitch? Okay, cool. All right, so that was kind of heady stuff, but I'm going to ask you some, you know, orchestration 101 okay. questions. Uh, what is the range of your instrument? Lowest note, highest note, and, and uh, on the B flat clarinet, you have available to yourself a, a concert D. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, what's that sound like? Here. So that's the D below middle C yeah. on the piano. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, dealing with uh, level of comfort for varying reasons, the, the, the top note that you would have would be uh, the F um, three octaves above. Okay. Okay. That's the F above the treble staff, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And are there, I mean, is that a general low note and high note? Does it vary depending yeah, the, on the type will, of... Uh, there will not be a, a note available to you lower than that on the B-flat clarinet, for example. Uh, some, some of us are, are facile above uh, the, the F that I just played for you, but um, it's generally best to be avoided. All right, now what about dynamic ranges throughout the pitch range? Is, can, you be, can you do pianissimo and triple forte at all? Um, yeah, it, it, I think, again, to, to generalize, I think for this, the scope of the people that, that might be watching and interested in, with this, uh, with that you know, range from that, the D up to the F, um, it, you know, the majority of things are available to you. Some notes are a little bit more hesitant than others because of the way, you know, the unique construction of the clarinet being built in a 12th instead of an octave. Uh, so, for example, you might have a note um, that is below that, uh, that concert F, that can lend itself to being a little bit grunty if, if you know, uh, your read is not working particularly great that day right. or something like that. So, um, uh, in general, uh, you know, all dynamic ranges are available. And the unique thing about the clarinet um, is really dealing with that it, it can move from from loud to soft very very facile. Okay, and what is your comfortable? What is the most comfortable range that, let's say, if you're just writing a soloistic line? Mm -hmm. um, where where would that normally lie? Or Anywhere, I guess it doesn't matter because you can play any dynamic. I would say that uh, really 
from the lowest note that I, I played, the, the D, yeah. um, anywhere and including the um, the B flat, the um, the fourth below uh, the um, the F that I played. Okay. So um, so the fifth below. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, fifth below. Here we go. <laughs> Early in the morning. Up, up, up okay. through there, you know, and again, like when, when you're dealing with things like really, really soft uh, entrances, like a you know, very subtle uh, entrance, just the E above, uh, you know, so like that's okay. something that's not available to, to most of us, you know, like I, I feel pretty comfortable, but you know, it's, that's, so you that's a lot of heavy weight lifting to, to really feel comfortable with that. Okay. That's, that's good to know. Um, so let's go through the rest of the clarinets. Okay. Uh, so that's the B flat, the most common. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a bass clarinet. Can yeah. we take a look at that? Sure. So what is the range on this, this guy? Uh, here you have something that's unique. Um, if, if someone's uh, looking, you know, first of all, if you can take a, a close in of this, um, you'll see, uh, if you had a tight shot of the B-flat clarinet, that you'll have an extra key here. There's one here, and there's actually two on the back. So the way that the orchestral bass clarinet is written for the majority of time now is that you actually have um, four other available notes to you that you wouldn't have on the B-flat clarinet. So you can actually go uh, you know, a, a third below what you would have available to you on the, the B-flat clarinet, or the octave below. Oh, okay. So it, I, hopefully that made sense. So all right, well, so the transposition of this is what? Uh, it's also in B flat. It is B flat, mm -hmm. and is that treble clef or bass clef? Most performers will uh, prefer, even if there's ledger lines, to, to see things printed in the treble clef. Uh, okay. With, with modern music in particular. Got it. So the yeah. transposition, technically, it, what is it's a it's an octave plus a second. Mm -hmm. and that, and that yeah, can. that's right. All right. So uh, so you can hear the difference between the you know the low concert D on the clarinet and on the bass clarinet. Sorry, the chair's a little low for me here, but yeah. That's a low what? B That's flat? a low D. D, D, D. Okay, so, so your fingering was exactly the same? Fingering the same. So exactly. uh, the, where it becomes complex is that as you get in the upper register above that, that B flat that I, I played on, on the clarinet where I just had my thumb down, but you know, yeah. constant B flat. Um, on the bass clarinet, things change very rapidly okay. from there. So if you have... You know, up in the upper register is very different than what you have here. Okay. You know, because if you look very closely, so I, I'm I'm actually trying to show that as I'm moving from the B flat to the B natural, um, I'm I'm showing a processor of what I have for the bass clarinet because this is part of as we get used to playing more than one instrument. Um, this is the sort of thing that you have uh, not necessarily. Uh, safety lashes for yourself, but when I, I know that I'm going to have a quick switch from B-flat clarinet and maybe I play a part for four measures and I have four measures to switch from the, the B-flat clarinet to the bass clarinet, making that same movement on this is, is a bit more treacherous when you're dealing with that. Mm -hmm. So the first one was not very successful and the second time I did by having to move the air a little bit further down than I did okay, on the B-flat clarinet. And you'll notice that um, the, the technique that I was mirroring on the B-flat clarinet was sliding down here a little bit. This, this key has to be down, otherwise it, that note will just grunt away. So right, so without it being do? down, th this key, what it does is actually works as a speaker vent, so that way the, uh, the upper parcel doesn't pop out. I have one question uh, that seems to be a lot of confusion is the lowest note, because some bass clarinets, at least from like the older textbooks, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that we studied, the Adler, yeah. it, it says, um, I think it says that the E flat is, or the D is the The printed low. E flat, the concert D flat. Yeah, yeah. Um, but can you explain, like, is, is there some kind of extension, and what's the standardization of it like. yeah in general now um, through really after Prokofiev Romeo and Juliet was a seminal piece that create you know create a need for um, the, the extension or that minor third ex extension to go lower than what you would have from that concert D flat model uh, the thing that is appealing uh, for someone to have uh, to not have rather not have the uh, the extra minor third going lower is that you get a greater deal of resonance on the low F so some of us will actually bring two bass clarinets to, to a studio and, and decide which one to perform on depending on, uh, you know, like really being able to lean into a low F or not. So this note. I see. 
on What's that? Uh, th that's a concert F okay. uh, with a low E flat or a concert D flat model bass clarinet. It, there's maybe about another 30% more resonance in a lot of ways because this extra wood that's here dampens just a bit of the vibration of that note. Um, and it tends to mirror itself like throughout, you know, uh, all of the, at least for me, my experience with the clarinets and saxophones is very okay. similar. So with that extension, you can get down to the low yeah, B flat? Yeah, so, yeah, the, okay. when, when you have, uh, in the, the bass clarinet is explained through, certainly through Piston or Rimsky korsakoff or Adler, as you mentioned, um, this would be the lowest note that's available. <laughs> But you actually, now on this model of instrument, you have an additional um, three chromatic tones. Okay. And you can see that there's a bit of a, a fluffy or fuzziness about the, on the this, B. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, there's different ways of compensating it for that. Some um, of my colleagues have a model that has a, a hole drilled in the bell, okay. um, which will create a great solution for that note, but then some things have become unfavorable in other situations. So. Okay, so then uh, can we be confident in writing low B flats and, and yeah, definitely. Yeah, you, you, know, you can lean not worry that. about. We can ignore the orchestration textbooks and <laughs> uh, as far as it pertaining as far as to the low, bass clarinet, low, yeah, yeah, that, that would that, that you can Don't you have free reign so there. B you flats go, the lowest. Okay, you can go nuts on it. Yeah. Got it. All right, that's good to know. So that's the lowest range, right? And and what's the well, just the absolute highest note that you can play on this well, again, comfortably. Th there's a unique situation with that. It, you know, uh, it, it would mirror um, what you would have on the B-flat clarinet. So the, the um, F that I had mentioned before on top of the staff, okay. again, you're thinking of everything an octave lower, but fingering-wise, it's something that's available and comfortable to the you know, majority of professionals. It's something not to, to be afraid of. All right, let's hear the high, high. So you can, you know, that's a little sharp, but you know, you can get the, the idea that you can, you know, really have a lot of facile room up there. I, again, when you're dealing with that register, there's kind of a uh, anemic, in, in some ways, sound quality to it, and where you would be better served of having someone, especially if, the if they're playing yeah. between both instruments, to have an octave lower on the. Okay, so counter. comfortably B flat, it, like, what is it, B flat above middle C? Yeah. Is yeah. kind of like the highest. Yeah, that we should if think someone doesn't want to fuss their way through a, a, you know, their, their session, then I, that would probably be a good idea. All right, good to know. Yeah. Cool. All right, so that was the bass clarinet. Um, what do you got there? This is an E-flat clarinet, so you'll see uh, it you know, is about two-thirds the size of a B-flat clarinet. Okay. Um, and what and do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Why would you want to play... The tiny clarinet. What's, what's uh, the tiny the... clarinet is, is quite versatile in, in a lot of ways. So, uh, you know, certainly uh, for people that have an affinity for maybe John Williams, you can hear flashes of it uh, mm -hmm. utilized in like Raiders Lost Ark, for example, is a really good choice. Or uh, there's uh, a bit more of a directional um, timbral element to it. Than you would... So that's the low E as it's printed. The fingerings, uh, you know, generally throughout, uh, you know, the, um, the E on top of the staff or, you know, G as, as it would be printed. Sorry, other way around. B flat <laughs> going the other way. So the B flat on top of the staff moving down, uh, you know, to the printed E. You know, the uh, printed E is the same on, on all of the clarinets. So that's okay, one thing so that the, makes the... it unique for us, like picking up, you know, a clarinet to, uh, you know, say an E flat clarinet to an E flat alto saxophone, you have a lot of fingering changes. Where it's available throughout the clarinet family is that, you know, once you get used Pretty to the, the size of the keyboard, you have a lot of similarity. Okay. So, uh, so quick ranges of this instrument. What's the lowest? What are the uh, ranges of the E flat? Okay. So the E flat clarinet, uh, comfortably, you would have again as the printed note, uh, the low E, mm -hmm. and it has a maybe a little bit more uh, bulbous sound than you would have on either of the other two instruments. And then up to a again uh, a, a printed G uh, on you know quite high. Okay, so I apologize for that. So right. a little sharp, uh, but that's what you have in between. So anything in between it is quite comfortable. Got it. Okay, and that uh, is comfortable to play up there. Is the same it, it scenario is, um, where you should the, stay away from the first the top fifth. More than likely, uh, right. where it gets dicey is if you have uh, unisons along with piccolo, um, and maybe perhaps like a, a good example would be referring to um, Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony. The entire last page, you have unisons between the the, uh, the first trumpet, the piccolo, and the E flat clarinet, and it's it gets very dicey because you have you know okay. a lot of high A's at the end of the, the piece. So if you have a forty-five minute uh, 
you know, uh, arc of your score. At the end, you have everyone moving together. It's, you know, that range is difficult for all of us, not just the E-flat clarinet. Okay, so uh, now, obviously all these are different transposing instruments. Right. You know, you got a ninth, a second, and a... Minor third. Minor third. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously an orchestrator, a good orchestrator, will know to just put it in its written pitch so it sounds right. properly. Yeah. But I know you probably get parts all the time that are just in concert and you're just having to, uh, maybe not in a scoring stage, but yeah, well, how, how, how hard is it for you to just play something that's written in sounding pitch and make that's a good it? question. I would say that, um, again, in, in varying circumstances, there might be some times where if someone's looking for more punch in the upper register, you know, they have something that like a, a, a solely between the, the, the trumpet and B flat clarinet, that it might be more suitable to pick this up in, instead and then, and then read everything down a fourth. That okay. way, you know, um, and that's something that, you know, usually, you know, I won't just do unannounced or uninvited to do it, but, you know, as a suggestion, like, hey, look, you know, I have this instrument here with me anyway as part of, uh, you know, what you know, we each try to bring. To okay, a, so you'll read the B flat part on the E flat clarinet, down and, and yeah. you'll just know. Yeah, yeah. So you're pretty good at just not, uh, doing it in general. It's always a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you see a bunch of sixty fourth notes, it can get dicey. Okay. <laughs> but you know, right. like in general, if it, if it's like, uh, you know, you're moving around at a moderate pace, it, it's not it you know a horrible arrival. All yeah. right. So these are probably the three most commonly asked for clarinets, right? Yeah. Well, often yeah. enough, I'll I'll actually um, I will have my A clarinet out with me while I'm at work because there's a lot of times I find the sound more suitable. Um, it, you know, the sound okay. is a little bit more covered uh, and blending than you would have on a B flat clarinet. And again, really depending on what the, the, you know, the timbre of the music requires, uh, you know, sometimes it's a very good situation to, to okay. use it. A, and then you also have a C clarinet. Yeah, I do. So uh, what's the case, why would you use? A C clarinet um, is probably more akin to, you know, it's, it's uh, a little bit more trumpet-like in, in many ways, not quite as shrill as an E flat clarinet, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's popular in the music of Strauss, for example. If, if you listen to, uh, you know, Rosen Cavalier, there's many flashy passages there on the C clarinet that uh, it's, uh, it can create a, a lot more brilliance. Um, and it's, it's often used in Rossini's operas, for example. So it. um, it's, it leans more towards a kind of a, a, a brilliant sound or a more strident tone. Yeah, okay. I don't know if I would describe it that way necessarily. It, it can sound ethereal and beautiful as well, but it, it leans that way. Got it. As far as all the orchestra instruments go, the clarinet's pretty versatile, and you can and you can do almost almost anything. Well, that's in terms the of dynamics. Whole, yeah, and it, it speed. really it's um, the the advantageous nature because of the design. It's a flawed design when you again when you have the twelfth, uh, but that flaw is what allows it the, that extremes of uh, registral change. You know, like leaping around and and. Yeah. Being able to, to quickly change dynamic range to go from fortissimo to, to pianissimo is really not the biggest problem. It, you know, we, we're uh, our big, biggest conflict is probably with pitch, uh, okay. more so than the other orchestral woodwinds for sure. Oh, okay, um, just combating you know because of the way that it's built. Um, if to, without getting into a huge discussion about it, uh, when you're dealing with the fundamental, like for example with the um, uh, the E, uh, then you know, when you, you use the register key and, and slide up a, a 12th, then um, if the fundamental is in tune, then that'll be quite sharp. It sounds to me from this it, that the clarinet is a fairly versatile instrument and uh, probably offers the least amount of orchestrational concerns. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, just avoiding, you know, uh, awkward tremolos or trills as we, we'd covered previously um, okay. is, you know, the thing to, to take most heed with. Great. Well, this is really helpful. Uh, thanks, thanks for, for uh, coming in and help us. Oh, do this. my pleasure. You know, and, good uh, luck to everyone composing out there. It's, yeah. you know, we always look forward to, to new music and, and creative problems and issues to, to, to deal with. And, you know, the things that you guys do, uh, it's, it's invaluable for all the composers to, yeah. to have a really strong resource to, to create their music. So we just want to provide that for them on, on the other end of things when they can do it live. Cool. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. All right, well, that's the end of our uh, episode on the clarinet. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, stay tuned for the next episode.